It's been likened to a great migration. Every November, for a handful of days, lawmakers come to Springfield to do their business. We'll get an update on lawmakers. Lawmakers is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Mark McDonald at the State Capitol, and we are in veto session. Once a year for six days or so, lawmakers come back here to take care of some veto issues and some other issues if they come up, and we'll see if there are any surprises in store this year. Uh, first, Representative Jim Watson, from uh, Jacksonville, thank you for being with thanks us. Thanks for having us. Senator Bill Brady from Bloomington, thanks so much. Senator Brady, I want to start with you because this may be one of the first interviews you've done since your razor-thin defeat for governor just uh, just days ago. And uh, thank you very much for, for making yourself available. Well, thanks for having us, Mark. Yeah. Is it difficult to get your heart back in, this, in the business of the Senate? Well, obviously it was a, it was a close election. We won 99 counties uh, throughout the state. And, and as you said, a razor-thin margin is uh, kept us from victory, but it's uh, important work needs to be done here. Our state is uh, not doing well. Uh, we've got to muster up the leadership uh, to move Illinois forward. High unemployment rate, record deficits and debt. And we've got to continue to fend off a tax increase. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done here, so I'm, I'm happy to be able to come back to the state Senate and to try to work for the people of Illinois. This, this is a veto session, so some of this uh, is preordained business, but in your mind, What's the number one issue that has to be dealt with this November? Well, I frankly think we should just deal with the veto messages and we should all be working on balancing the budget. Uh, we have to, a backlog of unpaid bills, record deficits and debt, $13 uh, billion. Dollars. Uh, it's killing the unemployment in Illinois. Jobs and balancing our budget are the key focus that we need to be on. And unfortunately, a lot of dangerous issues get brought up in lame duck sessions. Uh, I hope those don't take the energy we need to focus on what we're going to do to bring jobs to hardworking Illinois families and what we're going to do to balance our budget and pay our bills. Jim, the, the question goes to your house now, really, because uh, House Speaker Madigan has said that uh, he doesn't think that there's a mandate for an income tax increase. Right. And he's, again, we feel like we're on familiar ground here. It seems like deja vu. Unless the Republicans get on board with a tax increase, he doesn't really have uh, any, in, there's no indication that he's going to move for one. Where do the Republicans in the House stand? Well, I, I think it's early to, uh, you know, just coming off a, a, a tough campaign, lots of tough campaigns. I think it's really too early to say. I can tell you this, that, that to have that spirit of cooperation is going to take a change in mindset, um, not only with, with my leader, Tom Cross, and, but, but with the Speaker. He's going to have to decide that he wants to sit down and work. And, you know, some of the zings that come through just even yesterday, there was a, you know, a, a a derogatory mark in, in the Springfield uh, Journal Register, that that stuff has to stop. If you really want to work together, if you want to really want to do this collectively, um, you also have to be prepared to do some things that maybe you hadn't done before. Pay as you go, 30-day uh, payment cycle before we raise spending, look at workman's comp reform. I think if you start talking about those issues, then you might get some help. Um, but it's it, it can't be just one-sided. It can't be one-sided on our end, and it can't be one-sided on their end. This, it's going to take leadership like we have not had since I've been here since 2001. We need somebody that can come in and help bring these folks together, and these, these this diverse ideas. And, and, and Okay, now that's generally the job of the governor. It should be. Generally the job of the governor. How, how, if you were governor, how would you handle this? Well, I'd bring reality to Springfield. Uh, We'd say this is all the money we have to spend. Now let's prioritize how we're going to spend it, uh, and we've got to pay the backlog of unpaid bills. So we would have set aside resources to pay down the backlog, as Jim said, a 30-day payment cycle before we increase spending, and then we would have said this is all we have to spend. Now the governor has to have the discipline to say you cannot spend more than this. The legislature needs to come into the process and determine the priorities, and that's what I would have done as governor worked across the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, to establish the priorities within the parameters we can afford. 
but unfortunately, we've seen the last two years kicking the can down the road, and we've record deficits in debt. Uh, we need Illinois' constitution and government is designed for a strong uh, executive officer in the governor's office. And the governor's got to step up and be a strong executive officer and say, we're going to live within our means. Now let's roll up our sleeves and figure out where the priorities of spending should be. Jim, do you see this governor doing that, especially during lame duck session? Or would this be an appropriate time for him to go ahead and, and develop what, what the senator's talking about? Well, I think he, I think he has to start now um, d d building a coalition. I mean, he has to start now with leading, and he has to start getting ideas. I mean, if I was him, I would go to, to Senator Brady and say, you know, it was a tough campaign, but tell me the things you would have done, and let's find some common ground. I mean, I mean, that's the type of leadership that we need, right, to, to, to get out of this. So um, it's never too early. I mean, you know, we, we've seen it the last six, seven years. It always comes down to the last day, and it's not a good project. There's no reason for that. We all know what needs to be done. Um, and, and I would think way outside the box. Yeah. I mean, I would be bringing in friends and foe alike and saying, let's have, let's have real dialogue. Absolutely. House Speaker Madigan has said uh, just yesterday, I think, it's going to take three to five years and it's going to take a combination of uh, revenue increases and spending decreases. And that seems like common sense to everybody. And uh, but, but getting there just seems to be impossible. I think he likes to blame the Republicans, particularly in the House, for, for not seeing any uh, anything but spending cuts, and uh, you know how, how how do you get how do you get beyond that? Well, I I think you you institute institutionalize some reforms uh, that that Republicans would like. Pay as you go. There is no there is no reason in the world that we should not have pay as you go. If you introduce a bill that has spending, show us how you're going to pay for it via cut mm -hmm. or tax increase. That is not hard. It's not who's a Republican who's opposed concept. To it? it's not, who's opposed to it? So far, it is, we have had that. I have brought it forth in the House. It has never been called for a vote. So I would say that the Speaker of the House is, is, is opposed to it for whatever reason. Maybe it's something that we could leverage and use. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to be accusatory. I want to be throwing ideas out to say, if you want to get there, if you want to get you know, those two components, the cuts and the taxes, whatever, you also have to have spending restraints. You have to institutionalize how change, institutionally change how this place works. Senator, your chamber already has sent a tax increase bill over to the House for, for their consideration. Is, uh, is, is that, I, I don't know whether you were okay with that, whether you voted for or against it. No. Is that going to stand? Is that what? I, I don't think so. I, I, I think uh, rightly so the Speaker of the House has, has indicated that this is no time uh, to raise taxes uh, during recessionary times, particularly with unemployment rates that we're struggling with here in Illinois. We have to raise revenues. But the way to raise revenues is through job creation. Uh, the, the private sector job market has told us that unless we get our act together, balance our budget, bring meaningful work comp reform and other things together, they're not eager to invest in Illinois. We've got to make them eager to invest in Illinois. And with the jobs, not only does a quality of life come to a family, uh, but revenues drive to the state. That's the type of revenue creation that we have to have. Uh, but as indicated, we need a strong executive officer in this state who, who will discipline the legislature. It's too easy for legislative members to sponsor a program that sounds good to everybody right. but has huge costs associated with it uh, when there isn't anybody in the governor's office holding us accountable uh, to the spending measures as Representative Watson indicated. And the governor's going to have to step up and he's going to have to be a fiscal disciplinarian and force the legislature to live within the means or they won't do it. It's, it's, not, it's not in their nature to do it and that's why it's so important we have a strong executive officer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, about vetoes since this is the veto session. Um, the, the governor uh, put an amendatory veto on uh, what's called a Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. disclosure. And uh, that got defeated in your chamber mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, they overrode the governor's veto and you voted in favor of overriding the veto. Mm -hmm. In fact, you mentioned the State Journal Register and they put some heat on you today and everybody else that mm -hmm. voted uh, against that. Why did you vote against the uh, disclosure? Well, I think there's two things that are happening with a lot of these FOIAs, and, and I think we need to have that out there as much as possible. But does, does everybody deserve the right to see how every single person, um, they're, they're, how they are evaluated? And what if there are certain things in there that you don't want to get out? So you, th th there's a fine line, there's a balance. And, and so I, you know, I'll take the heat, and, and, and I'll be happy to have the discussion with them if they want to. But I think, I think there's a fine line between um, 
what should be exposed to the public and what shouldn't when it comes to personal evaluations. Well, it's a performance evaluation. Mm -hmm. It's not a personal evaluation. It's it's a it's a right. how they're doing their job. Mm -hmm. If 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 I'm a citizen and I'm just being the devil's advocate sure. here, and I'm and I'm paying for the salaries and benefits of these employees, and and they are suspended or something, and and I can't find out if they're doing their job properly, I, I'm a little offended by that. You might you might find it harder to to get people that will come in given that that environment. Well, but isn't it the public's business? If, if employees are properly doing their job or not. Sure, absolutely. And that's why we have elections. I mean, you have elections every four years or every two years in our case, and then four at the higher level to, 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 to say that people can, you know, an executive branch is going to put the right people in the right spot. And if they don't, um, you know, you have somebody, you have that opportunity to run somebody against them in, in the end. This, I mean, look, to me, at some point, at some point, you have to trust people to do their job. And, and, and in the name of accountability, we're, we're, we've got all these different, um, I want to say witch hunts, but, but it's, we're creating an environment where it's just gotcha. And let's see who we can get next. I would rather focus on hiring the right people, having them do their job, holding them accountable, if not getting rid of them. Senator, this is, I think this is going to be seen in your house, in your chamber as well. Um, have you uh, considered this, and how would you how would you vote? You know, I'm, I'm not sure yet. I, I, Representative Watson brings up some great points. As an employer, if you start, if you were to open up all the documentation, you kind of diminish, maybe in fact, what the what the review process is all about. So there's a balance. Uh, it'll come to committee. I'm going to listen to testimony on both sides and, and weigh the testimony as we move forward with voting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're not there. You're not at a point where you've made up your mind yet. Not yet. Okay. And I think, you know, it's not, there are lots of votes that we take that, 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 that you struggle with. And, and, and that was, one. that Clearly. was obviously one. It's not, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, you, you know, I'm hundred percent right. It's, it was a tough vote. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, and I, and I admit, you know, I will always admit when somebody comes and says, Hey, you voted wrong and this is why, you know, you, listen you, to them. And yeah. You've got to, there are to good arguments for and against the bill. Correct. And you have to weigh all those. At the end of the day, you try to make that decision, whether it be this piece of legislation yeah. or others. Another mandatory veto the governor applied uh, was to an election bill, and um, he uh, wrote in uh, he wanted an open primary. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? It's a good idea, I think, an open primary. Um, I think the challenge you have is the process, right? I mean, can, can the governor, right. in essence, legislate with the veto power. What, was that an appropriate and, and, and mandatory sure, veto? Is that, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure that that was. Do I think an open primary is good? Absolutely. Do I hope that I will see him proposing a bill for an open primary now that he has won this election? Yes, and then we'll see you know, where that goes. Process, never forget that this process, if you let anybody start to abuse it, even if you believe in the cause, then you are setting the precedent for it right. to be abused when you don't like the cause. How about you, Senator? Well, I, I like the idea of an open primary myself as well, but I think Representative Watson is right that the abuse of the veto pen to legislate, to add, is something I don't think is there. And I think the governor, frankly, used it for political purposes uh, during election, and uh, he realizes that he didn't have that authority. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I want to thank both of you. Uh, Senator, yeah. congratulations on a campaign well run. Well, thank Our you. condolences for not winning. Representative, thank, thank you. you. And thanks I would so like much. to thank Bill as well. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And we will be back with more on Lawmakers. Welcome back to Lawmakers. We're joined now by Senator Larry Bomke of Springfield and Representative Rich Brower of Petersburg. Gentlemen, we, we talked in our last segment at some length about the elephant in the room here in the veto session, and it is, of course, the budget and, a, and a, some, something like a $13 billion deficit. And there's talks about raising this tax and raising that revenue stream and doing this, but there's very little talk about how we're going to pay off the existing debt that we have. First, you, Senator Bomke. Is there a common sense to way to go about an orderly fashion of getting the bills behind us before we talk about incurring more debt or even raising more taxes? Well, that's the first thing we have to do. We have to absolutely address the Medicaid issue through Medicaid reform. It appears the governor may be doing that. 
we have to go after Medicaid fraud, which we haven't been aggressively doing, which could be maybe billions of dollars. Uh, and, and there needs to be a deficit reduction and elimination plan, and we're not hearing that. The governor has proposed raising a tax, um, more money for education, but the truth of the matter is we have to address the deficit issue. We have to have a plan to reduce and eliminate the deficit, and I'm not hearing that plan. We, we, have, we have seen vendors and business people doing business in good faith with the state, and some of them are waiting up to a year for payment. Some of them have gone out of business. That's right. Some of them have lost their property. I was on a conference call with a company out of Texas uh, about a month ago with a local realtor. Uh, they are in the process of purchasing property that the state is renting, that the banks have had to have taken over. And, and their question to me was, can the state go bankrupt? We can afford to, mm -hmm. we're liquid enough that we can carry the state for a while, but not forever. Uh, you know what? I couldn't answer that. I don't think the state can or would, but I can't answer that. I mean, technically, we are bankrupt. I know you mentioned $13 billion, but we're headed towards a $15 billion deficit. Yeah. Bankruptcy I, 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 is some legal term, but basically, if you can't borrow any more money, you're bankrupt. That's right. And, uh, of course, we can borrow money, but at the rates that we have to pay to borrow money is, is obscene. Yes. Um, Representative Brower. I don't know if the ball, if I would say the ball is in your court since you're in the House of Representatives, but the Senate has passed a tax bill on onto you over there, and we've been here before. We stood on this ground before, where it's up to the House to come up with some kind of a uh, remedy for this. The House Speaker apparently is not in the mood to do that unless the Republicans are on board. Is that your read? Well, you know, we haven't been part of the negotiations for eight years now, and that's been very frustrating because. If we are expected to vote on something like that, we certainly want to have some input. As the senator said, Medicaid in the last four years have gone from seven to fifteen billion. They quadrupled the eligibility. Uh, they've done away with fraud investigation, and for the recertification, they send you a letter. You don't have to prove you're eligible. They send you a letter if you don't respond, you're automatically re-enrolled for another year. So there's a lot of fraud in in that fifteen billion dollar line item. And so we need to be looking at things like that first before we look at a, a revenue enhancements. You know, this Medicaid issue is very concerning to me and a lot of other people because the recent federal bill, the Obamacare bill, mm -hmm. makes tons of more people eligible for Medicaid than aren't right. already eligible. And you're saying it's already being abused. How in the world are we going to handle that? Well, it's, we need to get control of it. And this administration thus far has not done that. Uh, it may, needs to make a concerted effort to get control of Medicaid. Yeah, I think. I read uh, where we'll increase the rolls to from 500 to 800,000 more people. Uh, yes, the federal government will pay a large part of that increase, but at some point the state's going to have to take it over. So we have to, there has to be a concerted effort to get control of Medicaid and get control, as Representative Brower said, of Medicaid for all. Mm -hmm. Is there any caucus in the House that has made any kind of a move to the House Speaker? of getting together with some some sort of idea to come together on this. Besides a Republican caucus? Well, <laughs> maybe a smaller caucus of Republicans. Is, is anybody yeah. listening to each other? Over there? Not not yet, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll start here soon. You know, the election, we've had uh, six more House members on the Republican side. We've had two more Republican members on, in, in the Senate. Yeah. So hopefully this will be uh, the start of something good that, you know, we actually sit down at the table and have that ability to say, this is what's important to us and has some give and take. Let me stay with you, Representative Brower, for a minute. I, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're on the committee that is looking at a bill about the uh, safety, the pension of yes. uh, public safety employees. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, that's a hot issue because just earlier this week, mayors from around the state were in town trying to get a bill developed that would raise the retirement age, raise the number of years of eligibility for retirement. And, and raise the percentage of, uh, of, of the retirement income of, of the average uh, yes. salary. Where does that stand? And are you, is, there, is it close enough that we're going to come out of this session with something, you think? Well, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of misinformation <clears throat> about that. There's a lot of people that are worried that they're going to have these reductions in their pensions. And right now, with a two-tier system that is included on in everything that police and fire, it's just for the new hires. And it will be that for the police and fire pensions too. It will be a two-tier system. 
So it will be people hired after January 1st will be on that second tier. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, 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 of misinformation. There's a lot of people that are concerned. And so it, unless you're hired after the first year, that is not a concern. Right. Present, okay? Presently, I think the retirement age is 50 for public safety employees. This new measure would bring it to 60, wouldn't it? Well, there, 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 there's different measures out there. There's one for 55, there's one for 57, there's one for 60. And so when, when you look at it, the average hire is about 27 years old, then they go for, for 25 years. So they, they need to bring that up a little bit. They need to take away some of the sweeteners that they have in it. And that's what we're trying to work out now is what that second tier will mm -hmm. be. Senator, that's going to probably come over to your chamber at some point. What's your opinion on, on the, the whole issue? Well, until it gets over to our, to our chamber, we know exactly what the bill looks like. I really don't have an opinion. Um, it's hard to either support or not support something before you know what it's does, going to look like. Does 60 seem like a reasonable retirement well, I think age it, to you? It seems like a reasonable retirement age. Uh, uh, heck, I'm 60 and I don't plan to retire, at least from my private You're business. You're not carrying bodies another... down steps in a fire either, though. <laughs> oh, that's With true. a full body pack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, 60 right. becomes a concern yeah. on firefighters that you have somebody in this building under a lot of stress. So, I, I mean, there, there's some concern, yeah. and, and that's why I think it's important that we have that opportunity yeah. to talk about it. And let, let me add one more thing, uh, if the senator will let me real quick, is that the problem is not the benefits paid to police and fire, the problem was the actuaries were underfunded. And they did that for years and years and years. And then when you put in the fact that the stock market crashed, that's what caused a problem with a lot of these pensions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the Freedom of Information Act has been juggled a lot recently. Most recently, and a mandatory veto was, uh, was applied by the governor. And uh, Representative, I, I believe that you voted to override that veto, yes. that would have made that would have made the uh, uh, performance evaluations available to the public to see of state employees. Why yes. did you vote that way? Well, I think you should may, maybe start and make your uh, performance evaluations open to the public since you're in public broadcasting. Does that seem like a good idea? Well, since it I, doesn't, it does. Well, and, and, but there is a difference. Is, there is a difference if, if people are paid by public money. Yes. And if people are not, so of course that's a that's a huge difference. Well, we we had something out there that people that get um, uh, on welfare be subject to uh, drug testing. That's public money. Shouldn't they be subject to drug testing? And that bill has gone nowhere. Okay. So so. I'm, not, I'm still not sure what your, what your logic is, though, for voting against I don't against think it. your personal evaluations, because sometimes if it's a, a different administration, uh, a Republican looking at a, a, a Democratic uh, worker, that sometimes those things can maybe be a little um, skewed as far as really what they're trying to achieve. So it's the evaluation process maybe that's the problem. Not not the FOIA part. Well, I think the whole problem is that if, if you look at every industry, personal valuations are not open for public scrutiny. And I think that that would be silly to open that up, e even though you're working for the federal government, for the state, for the county, for the municipality, I think that those things are best to keep locked up. Okay. Let's talk about uh, some ways that we can raise revenue in this state. Probably during this session, there's going to be some gambling, gaming uh, legislation, at least discussed, if not passed. Um, there was a committee meeting, I believe, earlier this week that was jammed with uh, all, all kinds of interested parties about extra licenses, and in fact, even maybe moving the Paradise up in East Peoria to a different location and adding a, 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 a stationary casino. Is there a possibility, Larry? Well, I, I don't. I'm not sure there is. I mean, it's it's going to. I'm afraid it's going to die of its own weight. They keep adding more things to it. There's no question the horse industry is in dire straits, and it's a major industry um, in the state of Illinois. Some of us would like to help that horse industry, but I think that this, this bill, at least the bill that was heard last night in committee, is so weighted down, and they keep adding so many things to it that uh, I suspect that it won't be called for a vote. Uh, there aren't the votes now. There were not the votes last mm -hmm. night in committee. That's why it was not called. And they keep adding more things to yeah. it. So I think it could die uh, uh, by just simply being having too too many things in it. Yeah, yeah. And 
your opinion on it? You know, the, the senator hit it right on, on, on the nail on the head that this thing has gotten so big that it will go nowhere. And I think it's done that by design. We need to do something to, to, to help out the horse industry, uh, but this bill, the way it's designed, is it's designed not to go in, in, in for a vote. Okay, we have just enough time to talk about the amendatory veto to the open to the election law, which includes an open primary. The governor, uh, it, it, it some some uh, argued about the way he handled this, uh, but he did uh, amend the amend the uh, election law to include an open primary. Is that something you can get behind? I sponsored a bill, and I think Representative Brower did, uh, or at least co-sponsored with Representative Cole in the House, uh, the bill that I had got uh, got a vote on, on the floor. It received uh, 17 votes. The Helmut Law only got fewer votes than it got. Yeah. So we have had an opportunity to, to uh, discuss it on the floor. Uh, it didn't get many votes. I, I, if it gets a vote, I, I'm not sure it will. I don't think the speaker yeah. will allow it to get a vote. Yeah. If it gets a vote in the uh, in the House and gets, I'm no, I can't speak for Representative Brower since he co-sponsored the bill earlier. I suspect he would be voting for it, and I will be voting for it in the Senate if it gets there. What the governor did was illegal. That what a lot of people don't realize in a primary, that's not really an election. It's a nomination process for Republicans, for Republicans, for Democrats, for Democrats. But there's a lot of people that don't like that. They want it open. So be, be, because of that, and I don't think the speaker will bring it up for a vote, but I would certainly support it. It's, it's the process that you object to, the, the way the governor brought this to the Yes, to the it, 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 it should have had some discussion, and, and, and it didn't. He overstepped his authority and by put, putting that in there like he did. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with us. I thank want to thank you. Ha happy Thanksgiving to you all. You A also. productive veto session, and uh, you'll and be back. Christmas. You'll be back <laughs> after January, right? right. After January one, uh, we will. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back with you in January as well when uh, the new spring session begins. Maybe before that, with another lawmakers. I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Lawmakers is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.